can uh, live up to all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but appreciate the invitation to join the meeting today, and um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to present a little bit about FinGen as a cohort that's relatively new and maybe unfamiliar to some of you, and then also um, a global meta-analysis activity that we've initiated starting from, from our work in FinGen. So um, why did I move to Finland and why is there a FinGen project? What does it mean? Well, it, it comes from a unique combination of, of data resources that exist in Finland in a combination that really does not exist very in a very facile way in many other parts of the world, perhaps nowhere else. Um, this involves comprehensive and longitudinal medical and life registry data that it goes across all aspects of, of life and social uh, registries as well. Um, a unique isolated population genetic history in Finland, and a deep investment in both genetics and epidemiology, as well as a willing population participation in this type of research. And with those bring opportunities that we can use genetics and epidemiology in combination to identify therapeutic targets that may be effective, that might avoid ones that would have toxic side effects, and also bring a lot of possibilities for the identification of biomarkers and genetic predictors that might be used in prevention as well. And so these opportunities have generated interest for a long time in, among some of us, but more recently, broad, more broadly, because of the combination of the efficient registry system of universal health care, the requirements by law that medical information is entered in these national registries, whether it's provided by a private or public partner, um, and the population genetic history, as well as an innovative biobank law that I'll describe um, in, that was passed in 2013, have created a unique ecosystem in Finland for making this type of research possible and the type of research supported by the government, the people, and these national registry systems and the well-functioning healthcare system is such that when we recruit an individual into a research study of any kind anywhere in the country, they can immediately be linked, consented to be linked to their entire life history of medical encounters, be they prescription medications that have been filled, be they procedures, be they specialty clinic visits and so forth, as well as a bunch of other life registry information. And so that allows us to, instead of taking cross-sectional looks at genetics, really to begin to take lifelong looks at our genetic research. And I think opens up, along with other cohorts that you're hearing about here at the meeting, new possibilities for really investing in a variety of different and longitudinal phenotypes over decades in some cases um, than we've been able to historically do. And so that's been the genesis of the FinGen project, which is a real functioning public-private partnership to support the building and construction of the resources in Finland to take advantage of this unique genetic and data, medical data registry um, situation. And the, it actually would involve, in principle, two parallel and very different types of recruitments and two essentially different cohorts, if you would put it in today's, in today's language. Given the decades of investment in legacy epidemiology collections, roughly half of the study will end up coming from samples that were collected in some cases 20, 30 or more years ago. And so these are now very valuable samples in terms of pursuing longitudinal endpoints, endpoints late in life, and prediction activities. And the other half of the study or more is based on new clinic-based recruitment targeted at clinics that are seeing patients in key disease areas that are often not as well represented in broad population collections or just collecting everybody who walks through the front door of the hospital. The key elements of this um, are creating a framework in which, very similar to what Anthony was describing, secure cloud access to this sensitive project data can be granted to researchers located in different parts of the world while the data stays securely in one location, so bringing people to the data. This, I think, is, as Anthony described, a very important um, you know, key thing that we need to keep emphasizing and building methods around. Um, it's not totally novel because this is how the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium has conducted its gen genome-wide activities for the last decade using a central server and bringing analysts around the world to it, but it is clearly the way of the future. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned, the key elements of what happens in Finland surround a national biobank law that was passed five years ago, which facilitates a use of a broad consent, so recruitment of individuals throughout the country um, for all types of medical research, not for one specific project, um, facilitates recall studies for genotype, phenotype, or any reason, um, and facilitates the registry linkage activity that I described. So with that in mind, we've begun the FinGen project late in 2017. It's about a year and a half old. Um, thus far, the current progress is that we have um, recruited a large number of samples into the project. Already in the current data freeze, there are about 150,000 fully genotyped and phenotyped individuals with this diverse registry activity. Um, and the analysis of this is an ongoing activity with data freezes happening every six months. So we began to, um, with the second data freeze, notice that in fact there were some unexpected findings which we first thought were, were bugs or artifacts of some kind. For example, a, a locus that we had never seen before in inflammatory bowel disease despite having a small number of cases. Um, and what it turns out that you can see a very clear pattern of, of associations to inflammatory diseases, and this simply represents what we knew was out there, but not exactly in what quantity, which are alleles that are very, very specific to Finland and vanishingly rare anywhere else in the world. And so this caused us to remember one of the driving reasons which we had sort of set aside and not overemphasized in performing these studies in Finland was not only the registry basis and the consent of the entire population, but the fact that there is a long history of understanding that the Finnish population has been remarkably endogamous after a bottleneck that founded the population roughly 100 to 120 generations ago. And that this bottleneck was well described over the 90s as the source of unusually common alleles that com conferred significant um, risk to Mendelian recessive diseases. About 50 of them have been well documented. But in recent years, we've started to identify a set of alleles from this category that also have common associations to common endpoints in heterozygous form. And the reason we begin to see those coming in larger and larger numbers is that it turns out that there's quite a number of them. Um, so Conrad, using the wonderful NOMAD resource from uh, Daniel's group, who will speak on further things about the NOMAD resource uh, soon, um, has been helping to develop a clear enrichment model to identify where there are these unique alleles in Finland that are not seen anywhere else or that are seen very, very rarely in other parts of the world. And as it turns out, there are probably 15 to 20,000 protein coding variants that are in a testable allele frequency range. Um, and many of them severe loss of function or truncating variants um, that are very, very rare or absent from the rest of the world's population. And so this creates a great opportunity to make novel insights um, specific to Finland. And so we begin to, to do that and pursue these, as I said, they, we're, they are well known to be the source of probably about 50 Mendelian recessives, but now we are looking for common endpoints associated to these types of alleles. And in fact, if we perform, for example, a GWAS of type 2 diabetes, we see exactly what we should see for a GWAS of type 2 diabetes with about 17,000 cases, a large number of well-known diabetes associations that have been discovered over the last decade. But we also find, in fact, six novel associations that are in fact not documented in the largest meta-analysis that was just published by the Type 2 Diabetes Consortium. One of these, the orange star down low there, is an already published variant in AKT2, which was published because of sequencing studies performed in Finnish population. But the interesting thing to us is now that there are at least five others of these and probably more with the next freeze of the FinGen data. We also begin to explore whether prediction activities can start to become more and more impactful as a source of information, um, using especially the fact that there's about 100,000 of the samples that are in the newest freeze that have a long history of medical information, many of them recruited from those cohorts that were began in the 80s and 90s. And particularly interesting is combining not only polygenic risk, but the fact that rare 
penetrant mutations can, exact, can already be identified from array-based genotyping data in Finland because of the bottleneck. Instead of having tens or hundreds of ultra-rare variants in genes such as PAL2 and CHECK2, which are well-known breast cancer genes, we have in Finland a concentrated allele frequency spectrum in which a single frame shift variant in each of these genes is seen at an unusually high frequency in the Finnish population, creating further opportunities for prediction. And so if you take not only polygenic risk extremes, but add on top of it the recognition which we have in 150,000 individuals of who is a carrier of a high impact CHECK2 or PALB2 mutation, you can see the risk is truly profound when we begin to combine those pieces of information. And in fact, they are quite independent. And so those who have a severe mutation and in the top 10 percentile of polygenic risk have a very particularly high lifetime risk. So the time to start thinking about inf use of this data to inform screening practice is very likely at hand. Um, so the last section of the talk, I wanted to introduce um, an activity that we initiated, recognizing that you know what we can do in Finland will be great and fun, but it's only a small piece of what needs to be done and what can be done on a global level. And so the idea of studying isolated populations gives you many important advantages, but also is then, on the other side, extremely limited in terms of the genetic variation pool that's available to fully flesh out and understand the role of each gene in health and disease. And so with that, we began reaching out to colleagues who had similarly mature data about the possibility of building a global biobank meta-analysis. This is something that could be done today and will be done today or this year um, and is not meant to be, uh, you know, sort of to disrupt or compete with activities which need to take place over the next decade to build an infrastructure wherein much deeper data sharing can be undertaken between cohorts and consortia the world around. But at the same time, since there is a very facile way in which mature studies can combine in a meta-analysis non-identifiable summary statistic data for important common medical endpoints, consistent with pilot activities in the consortium that Nancy was describing this morning, we should be able this year, and should do so, combine perhaps up to two million potential samples that are already analyzed in cohorts and data sets sitting there, very similar to what Ellie described um, at a larger scale for the osteoarthritis consortium. And so I think creating a framework and principles around which this type of lightweight data sharing that can happen now and today at the same time and in parallel with the significant activities that, that Anthony was describing, which will obviously take a more substantial effort to come to fruition, will both be very productive and can happen in parallel. As a small example of, of what is likely to take place in this space. We can see that, for example, last year, one of the largest asthma published GWAS meta-analysis was, was revealed with 24,000 cases, 16 distinct loci identified, many of them well-known in, in, you know, it's a who's who of inflammatory loci. Um, just a quick look at the FinGen data, of course, the very strong statistical results for the vast majority of those findings, maybe one or two new findings interspersed in there. But the real value of the activity comes even at a very early level, bringing together four of these cohorts that were just conveniently happened to be available because the, the researchers responsible for the primary analyses of these cohort all happened to end up in my lab this past year. Um, that combination creates already 52,000 cases of asthma just from those first four cohorts and 52 independent loci that could be mined, though to my knowledge this is just an, ex you know, it, no one's actually started to look at these results yet. This is simply a demonstration of what should happen in a global setting. So with that, I wanted to, of course, you know, reinforce that this is a completely open activity that anyone should feel encouraged to participate in and help to develop the principles around. And we'll be, we'll be initiating further calls and, and activities around this in the upcoming months. Um, and thanks to my many colleagues in the 
FinGen project um, in Finland and in Boston. And thanks for listening. Maybe time for one question? Yes, come on. Mark, uh, that was great. Thanks very much. You, you um, uh, alluded a, a little bit about the original impact that Finland had, not being in the SNP era or the sequencing era, but in the familial segregation yes. way back before, which is absolutely right. Um, presumably now with all the data you've got and the records you've got, you can reconstruct quite a lot. Or either you have it or you could reconstruct it with some accuracy, both going down and going up and backwards like Hakon and his many cousins. Yeah. Do you, do you, you <laughs> but you didn't, you missed it, but this morning we had a good talk with um, So, but you didn't, none of your findings used that sort of information. I, I was wondering, do you just not find it useful or did you not have time to talk about that? No, no, we, we really haven't gotten into it yet. The first year, year and a half of, of the project has been so focused on simply the operations of recruiting patients, getting the, the, the genotyping done, and getting core analyses in place that there's an enormous amount of opportunity that we haven't yet begun to, to explore in this project. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark, and, and congratulations on your new position. Uh, it's, it's clear that the Finnish government has made an incredible investment in all of this, and now you. Um, <laughs> wondering, uh, uh, so what's the return on that investment that they're anticipating? And more specifically, some of the speakers this morning said a lot of this will be, it may be for naught if we don't really think about translating to the clinic. So do you have an established pathway to move, particularly the Finnish private you know, variants that you're finding into clinical care and show that they're actually useful? Well, it's, a, it's, it's twofold, I think. It's, it's on the one hand, the biobank law, um, the, if one of the additional provisions of the biobank law is that individuals can request their data and have their data back, and that there is, with the partnership to the medical system, a path that is being developed wherein that information can get back to the right place, which is the patient's national health um, record when this information becomes recognized as actionable, and which I think you will agree that already, whether we are looking for it or not, we stumble across things that are actionable. Um, the other part of why the government invests in is I think they see this as, a, as part of a, a national growth strategy for innovation, that by building and investing in this resource, they have an opportunity to leverage resources that, that exist in Finland in a way that will attract um, you know, business from around the world, as it were. And so I think there's a duality of, of the idea that we can be acting in a way that promotes you know, responsible use of genetics in public health, which is what we're very excited about, and at the same time be building a framework for innovation. Philip. Uh, it was a great presentation, Mark. Uh, this, you reminded me of about some publications that came out, the population genetic studies about three or four years ago, that were looking at the impact of small versus large population size on the aggregation or accumulation of damaging mutations. Do you think so, you know, you're looking here to, uh, uh, like, uh, <coughs> a bottleneck or, uh, sorry, a founding population, you can argue founding a population bottleneck, uh, uh, Quebec, Sardinia. Is it worth kind of revisiting that and looking at those populations and seeing if there's enrichments for those, say, high-impact mutations? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, you know, we're now in a, it's a great time to revisit all these things because we, for the first time, have, have sequencing data at a scale where you can do analysis of things like in, in Nomad that allow us to actually empirically rather than theoretically see what the impact of, of those founding bottlenecks and, and subsequent endogamy or rapid expansions is. Great, thanks. <coughs>